Это я получаю. Ну, платят там больше, а я еще по среднему выставляю, понимаешь, вот тот человек, который меня отправляет для этого. Обязательно. Я сначала сама. Я посмотрю, если она вам подойдет. Значит, я позже звоню, приезжаю, смотрите сад. Я же одну буду катать, что ты расстанешь. Я забыл. Ты правильно говоришь? Совершенно верно. А, здравствуйте. Ну, давай, It's a very profitable business. Our girls are in high demand since they're quite pretty and easily accessible. I had 20 to 25 men a day. They were given 15 minutes each. And if we went into overtime, people knocked on the wall for us to hurry up. I saw them beat up girls. So I tried to get out of there. I cut my wrists, right here. They told me, you want to die, you'll get your wish. Look what they did to me. Before this, I hadn't encountered much evil in my life. I couldn't believe places like that actually exist in this world. I thought I'd find at least one kind person or that one of those pimps. would set me free. Odessa, Ukraine, a port town on the Black Sea known for its nightlife and its beautiful women. But there is a more sinister side to Odessa. Odessa is the organized crime capital of the former Soviet Union. We've come here because Ukraine is one of the largest suppliers of trafficked women into the global sex trade. For decades, the port of Odessa was used to traffic arms and drugs. Now, it's used for human trafficking. Our crew is at the port right beside the famous Odessa steps. Our cameraman is set up overlooking the main entrance. Posing as a tourist, I have another camera. We're here because we received a tip from the Ukrainian Secret Service. Frustrated with their lack of jurisdiction in Turkey, They've given us details about a suspected sex trader who regularly uses the port of Odessa to traffic young women to Turkey. Her name is Pasha. She's not tall. She's fat. Blonde with a short haircut. The Secret Service has told us that Pasha runs a legitimate business as a cover. She helps men and women from the former Soviet Union find domestic work in Turkey. She handles the travel arrangements and accompanies her clients on the two-day boat journey to Istanbul. I thought I was going to work in a shop. We were told that there are lots of women from Moldova and Russia working there. We were told that we could earn $200 a month. She bought tickets for us. We waited till evening. There were young and old people with us. We were going for work, but we didn't know why everyone else was going. Most of Pasha's group are destined for work as domestics in Istanbul. But if our source is correct, some of these young women with Pasha are headed for a far worse fate. 
two floors above Pasha and her group, an office has been set up to deal with victims of sex trafficking. Today, the office is visited by Virel, a man whose wife has been sold into the sex trade. Virel's nightmare began when his friend Vlad, who had traveled to Turkey with his wife, called him. Virel's wife Katya went to Turkey to buy merchandise to sell at her mother's market stall. Vlad and my wife went to Turkey to buy some supplies wholesale. Pens, notebooks, etc. Vlad told me, I'm going there anyway, so I can take your wife along, so she won't have any trouble. I know Turkish, I'll help her. Then he called and said that he had sold her for $1,000. He didn't look like a person who'd do something like that. An ordinary, quiet man speaks normally. If I had the slightest doubt, I wouldn't have let her go with him. For Katya, I was paid $1,000. That's how they priced Katya at the time. He sold my wife for a thousand dollars because she'd given birth before. So as merchandise, she was only worth one thousand dollars. Girls who haven't had children are more expensive. Vlad found out that the woman he had sold Katya to had in turn resold her to a notoriously violent pimp called Apo. Apo is a person without a shred of human decency. He has no principles whatsoever. At times he can be... very cruel. Apo is the cruelest pimp in Antalya. He even terrifies the police. He's got many bodyguards. He's got connections. And a lot of guards who watch the girls. To be honest, I didn't know what to do. I phoned VRL and told him. It's easier to tell a person over the phone rather than face to face. He said, I've sold your wife. I immediately realized that I shouldn't jump on him. Otherwise, he'd disappear. Like, he wouldn't give me his telephone number, and I would never find him or my wife. I spoke to him nicely. Imagine the situation. This person you know calls you and says, Dear friend, I sold your woman. We've been married for a year. She's pregnant with my child. Why did I phone him? To say that I felt guilty might sound absurd after what I did. However, strange as it may seem, guilt played its part. Vlad helped VRL contact Apo, the pimp who now owned Katya. With his wife in the hands of a dangerous and violent pimp, VRL felt he had no choice but to go to Turkey, pretend to be a trafficker, and try to buy Katya back. 
Apple thinks I'm a pimp just like him. If he found out that she's my wife and that the baby is mine, he'd kill her. I called Apo and negotiated with him directly to buy her back. I asked him, what do you want, girls or money? And he said, money. Katya was being held in Antalya, Turkey, a tourist town on the Mediterranean. Fiorel set up a meeting with Apo at the Antalya airport to buy Katya back. He then contacted the Turkish police and told them his story. They brought me to the airport and stationed police everywhere in order to nab him. Then I called Apo and he came. I came up to him, but I didn't see my wife in the car. I asked him where she was and he said she was working. She was with a client. Then, for no reason, a policeman blew his whistle and Apo took off. He now refuses to speak to me. Burel now feels that informing the police was a grave mistake. What can you think of the Turkish police? There were 60 officers involved in a guarded airport with only one entrance and one exit. There's a checkpoint and tons of police, and they let Apo slip away. I'll do anything to get her out of there. Whatever it takes, I don't care. I'd sell my fucking organs. With or without the help of the police, Burel is determined to return to Turkey to somehow save his wife. Katya's journey into the hands of one of Turkey's most violent sex traffickers began in Moldova a nation sandwiched between Romania and Ukraine. Moldova is the poorest country in Europe. 80% of the population lives below the poverty line. Tiraspol, its second largest city, is famous for arms, drugs, and human trafficking. It is also Katya's hometown. Here's Katya when she was little. She liked to dance a lot. She played music. I pushed her to go to Turkey so we could make some money. Some people do manage to make money. It's probably my fault because I encouraged her to go. When Katya left for Turkey, she left her five-year-old son Ruslan in the care of her mother. Here I am with her five-year-old child and I'm 60. I told him that she went to work. What else can I tell a child? That his mother was sold? Imagine. He keeps crying all the time and asking why it's taking her so long to come back. What can I say to him? He's so little. Where's my mama? Where's my mama? What can I tell him? Today, 23-year-old Tanya is seeing her family for the first time since she was brutally trafficked into sexual slavery.
I couldn't believe this was happening to me. I asked myself, don't these pimps have any children? Don't they have a heart or a soul? They may get away with it in this life, but ultimately, God will punish them. I worked as a cook at a cafe in the town of Nikolaev. I had never traveled before. When I worked in Nikolaev, it was my first time away from home. The first person in a trafficking chain often knows the victim and her family quite well. In Tanya's case, a woman who frequented the cafe befriended her and then offered her a job as a nanny abroad. She knew my family circumstances and said I'd have a lot to lose if I passed this up. Tanya's family lived near Chernobyl when the worst nuclear reactor accident in history took place. Exposed to radioactive fallout, her family was relocated to a village in western Ukraine. Tanya's family is now plagued with health problems. Her mother and older brother have tuberculosis, her sister has a brain tumor, and her brother has chronic abdominal troubles. The doctor said that we need a lot of money for special treatments. He said that if he doesn't get treated, we might as well order a coffin for him. I was going to take a night bus. My daughter was asleep. I went to kiss her goodbye. She woke up and started begging me. Mama, don't go away. I told her, I won't be long. I'll come home very soon. She put her hand under the pillow and gave me her little wooden cross. She put it in my hand and said, Mama, keep it with you. I said, why? It's yours. No, you take it. It's my gift to you. There are a lot of ways that these young women are recruited. One of the ways is in, in ads. They offer them jobs as nannies, as waitresses, as, as cleaning uh, uh, hotel rooms, and jobs that uh, are real menial pay, but they want to do them because at least they're going to get something to send back home. But they're not realizing what is out there, the kind of scary things that are really out there. The traffickers are very skilled. They know how to pick out a vulnerable woman. If you gave them five women, they'd probably make a beeline for the most vulnerable and get it right. But even if there's some niggling doubt in the back of their mind that this might not be you know, the perfect job opportunity or there might be something a little bit dodgy about it, they're going to desperately want to believe that it's OK. So they're going to be far more likely to just take that risk and to go because, you know, what could be worse than the life they're having at the minute? And, of course, there is something worse. <laughs> Yeah. 
Забирай паспорт и становись. Он должен ее встретить, то я, я не знаю, кто тебя кто-то будет встречать же. Ну, в общем, сразу же раз и документики пусть будут. Мы будем говорить здесь, что будут документы. Это не на самом деле забирайте. Не будет спокойно. Anyone who works with people has to understand their psychology. You have to know how to lure someone in. They don't even have money for basic food. So most people try to find work abroad. Once they hear words like abroad or big money, they're hooked. These people are criminals. They will put their hand to anything that makes them money. They don't want to be caught, and it's easier to move women across boundaries and borders than it is drugs, because the customs are there, they know what they're looking for, but a, a woman coming into an airport with a luggage, a passport, very difficult to identify. И тем более я знаю, что если, не дай бог, что со мной случится, мои зубы на полку тоже сложат, и на второй зубе. Тем более у меня девочка, вот невеста и дочка в академии учатся на юристов, понимаешь? Рисуюсь, чтобы я не подорвала авторитета. А через э, Украину, через Одессу хорошо отправляют? Ну опасно, везде опасно, будь осторожны, мне кажется. А где легче? Нигде не легче. Нигде не легче, ты понимаешь? Back at the port of Odessa, Pasha and her unsuspecting group board the ship for Istanbul. We took the ship Caledonia to Turkey. There weren't enough tickets in the booking office for everyone, so they crammed more people than usual in one cabin. I can't say I was very happy or excited. I worried a bit because we were heading for a foreign country. We hoped everything would be okay. Follow Pasha and her group through Turkish customs. They have no problems getting through. Our cameraman is secretly filming from a parking lot overlooking Istanbul's port building. I'm standing by the entrance with a hidden camera in my bag. She's walking right towards us. According to our sources in the Ukrainian Secret Service, some of these girls will be sold to brothels across Turkey. The plan is to keep on Pasha's trail in Istanbul and see where the women in her group end up. Turkish fixer has a good idea of where they're headed. They are going to Aksaray, that, that, that place, Russian district. Yeah. Aksaray is a bustling district in the heart of Istanbul, home to countless expatriate Soviets, many of them migrant workers. Compared to the life left behind in the former Soviet Union, Aksaray is full of employment opportunities, a chance to earn and save for a better life one day. But for many young women, Aksarai is the bitter end to their dreams.
Natasha leads us to a notorious spot in Aksaray. This parking lot is an unofficial market for Russian migrant workers. Goods are exchanged, deals are made, legal and illegal workers head to their new employers, and women are sold. She asked us to wait for a while. Then she approached us and said, come with me. We followed her and crossed the road. There were some men at a table outside a cafe. She brought us to those men and said that one of them was the owner of the shop. She told us they were going to drive us to the apartment where we were going to stay. She talked to them in Turkish, took money from them and counted it. I saw her counting the money. I got scared. She said, don't worry, everything is fine. Go with those men. They're good people. Don't worry. We guessed that she was selling us, but we hoped we were wrong. We hoped that we had misunderstood things. Back in Ukraine, we showed Anya and Katerina our footage. Are you sure? Anya and Katerina claim that six months earlier, Pasha sold them into sexual slavery. In almost every detail, their story matches what we witnessed firsthand. They brought us to an apartment. That night, a man woke me up. He told me to get dressed because I was going to work. I asked him, why am I going to work now? He said, get dressed and you'll see. He took me to a hotel. It was a nightmare. He simply raped me. I screamed and tried to run away. He was so cruel. I pleaded with him and begged for mercy. He laughed at me and continued what he was doing. They forced us to have sex with different Turkish men. They did whatever they wanted to us. They took me to a villa. It was a two-story house. They locked me in. I was shaking. I told them that I refused to do it. They said, what do you mean you refuse? That woman sold you for $5,000, and now you belong to us. They didn't see us as human beings, but just as whores, just as flesh that they could use. That's all. People have said to me, well, these girls can run, and they can't. They're taken to these apartments and these houses, usually in remote areas, and men come in and break them. They test drive them, they tell them you will move like this, you will do that, until you become compliant. And they make her submit to every indignity in front of all the girls, and they beat her and do whatever, even if they kill her. And all the other girls fall right into line. Everything depends on the psychological state of the girl. If she has a weak psyche, she usually breaks down and accepts that she'll have to work as a prostitute. 
If she can't be persuaded, she'll be physically forced to do it. I started crying. I said that I wanted to go back home to my child. The other girls told me, we also have children, and we also work, and you'll have to do it too. There's nothing you can do about it. They said they all got there the same way I did. That little cross, I always had it in my hand. Prayed, asked God to somehow help me get back home. I never dreamt of being in the situation I was in. I can't stop thinking about it. Those images continue to haunt me. A few days after her journey to Istanbul, Pasha was back at the port of Odessa. Her business done, she was off to find another group of clients. Virel goes back to Turkey to rescue his wife from Apo, the pimp who owns her, this time without the help of the police. Virel knows this is his last chance to get Katya back, and all he has is Apo's telephone number. So we're using his phone, right? His phone. Okay. Apo has a wife named Maria, who is his partner in crime. In his previous dealings with Apo and Maria, Virel has used a fake name, Seryoja. Virel must play his role as pimp convincingly. If he alienates Apo or Maria, he will lose any hope of getting Katya back. He hasn't spoken to either of them since Apo took off at the Antalya airport two weeks earlier. Hello, Maria. Привет. Я приехал в Анталию. Серёжа, ты приехал с России, там с Молдавии откуда ты приехал с Украины? Там ты ездил к ним, там сказал, что мы эту Катю украли. Я не говорил там, что Минта. Ты меня выслушай правильно. Ты меня выслушай правильно. Просто получается в ментовку заявила Катина мама. В Молдавии меня взяли за задницу на Украине. Понимаешь? Вот в чем дело. Им нужна Катя. И у меня есть единственный выход, чтобы не сесть, выкупить ее за деньги. А у вас это отвязаться от проблем, от чтобы она выехала вообще нахрен с этой страны. Короче, это Серёга. Короче, ты сходи к ним там, скажи там, что ты это мы не виноваты вообще. Солнце, а как я пойду к ментам сейчас? Ты что? Она твоя любимая. Кто? Катя. Да, такая же любимая, как вот эти мои тут. Ты не знала, какая она сучка? Я не знаю. Я знаю одно, что ее мама подняла большой-большой кипиш. А муж ее? Да я откуда знаю, там муж, муж, нафиг оно мне надо. Пустите ее, пусть она пройдет контроль этого, и там депорт ей поставит, шморт, что ей там не ставили. 
Вот что самое главное, чтобы ее не было здесь. Все, в Турции, чтобы ее не было, чтобы к вам претензий никто не имел. Позвони через 20 минут. Хорошо, мой придет, мы поговорим. Хорошо, Мария, без проблем. Хорошо? Да. Давай. Давай. Пожалуйста. Через 20 минут перезвонить. Фу, бля, разговор Вау. длинный. Нападение? Нападать на них, конечно. Это а говорить, какое нападение? Говорить на то, что вся проблема ихняя и моя, это Катя. Вот тупые люди, блин. Отдайте Катю, отдайте. Просто ее отдайте, и у вас нету проблем. Алло. Алло. И что вы говорите? Вот он, он говорит, что он тебя не доверяет. Ты ему ошибку, ты ошибку сделал. Он не может тебя доверять. Просто он тебя не может доверять. А ну дай, дай, дай мне с Катей, дай, дайте мне с Катей поговорить. Она сейчас не возле, не возле нас. А где? Она не возле нас, она, бля, в другом доме живет сейчас. Ну, мы, так... мы, мы одни. Так давайте, послушай, давай встретимся в вчетвером, Катя, ты, я и Апо. И посядем, нормально поговорим. Я клянусь мамой, что с моей стороны ни одного полицейского не будет. Ни одного и вообще никого. Я пришел, сели на нейтральной территории где-нибудь. Сели нормально в баре где-нибудь, сели и поговорили. Я обещаю, с моей стороны ничего не будет. Мы тогда завтра зазвонимся. Давай, я тебе завтра, значит, перезвоню. Давай. Господи, если она завтра придет на встречу с Катей, это все. Дадите мне рубашку с микрофоном и с камеры. И будете слушать весь разговор и видеть все, как что делается. Once a woman has been brutally initiated into the world of sex slavery, she can be used and sold from one pimp to another. Oksana was sold 13 times over an eight-month period. We serviced between eight and 15 men a day. There were 22 girls in a three-bedroom apartment and each girl got beaten up at least once a day. Some girls tried to jump out of the windows and broke their hands and legs. I was like a soldier going to battle who doesn't know if he's going to be killed or not. It was the same with me. And who's going to look for me? My mother? Try to convince the police to help. Sometimes Turkish policemen used our services. I knew from one pimp who I talked to quite a bit that he bought off the local police. One girl ran away and went to the police for help, but she was taken back to her pimp. There are prison-like brothels out there with locked doors and bars. You go there by invitation, specific people know where it is, and these women are locked up 24 hours a day. They are prisons. Posing as interested clients, we found someone who would lead us to a private brothel, discreetly tucked away in a typical Turkish residential neighborhood. They led us to an apartment where girls are kept virtual prisoners. They kept us in a locked room at all times. We worked for as long as we had clients, 24 hours a day. The ground floor apartment had bars on the windows. 
and they had guards watching the girls. To get them to cooperate, the traffickers offer their victims some hope. They suggest to the women that they can work their way to freedom by paying off their purchase price. He told me he paid a lot of money for me, and I had to work off this money for him. Okay, I said, I'll work for you, and I won't create any problems. I said, if I work off your money, would you let me go home? He agreed. Debt bondage represents the money that a girl is told she has to work off. That amount is easily inflated if the pimp wants. That way the debt never goes away and she continues to work without ever receiving a penny. He said, you'll be paid $500 a month. But the girls told me, he never pays $500 a month. He always finds a reason to fine you. For example, if a client asks you to do something and you refuse, and the client complains to the pimp, he'd charge you for a month or two, and you'd end up working for nothing. When a trafficked woman manages to pay off her so-called debt, she is thwarted by her pimp's power to sell her at any time. This creates a cycle of debt bondage from which there is no escape. One pimp sells her to another, he sells her to a third, this third one to a fourth, and so on, until... After Tanya was sold for the third time, she realized that she had come to Turkey pregnant and was starting to show. Her new owner noticed. My pimp said, you're going to have an abortion. I said that I didn't want to, that I wanted to have the baby. He said if I refused, he'd make my life hell, and I'd end up with a miscarriage anyway. He forced me to have an abortion. Five days later, I was sent to a client. You know, they just stuck a sponge inside me to stop the bleeding and sent me to work. With VRL's pregnant wife being forced to work as a prostitute somewhere in Antalya, getting a meeting with Maria and Apo is the only thing on his mind. Hello. Hello, Maria. This problem. The camera is this button here. That's the camera. Yeah, and try not to touch your shirt because there's a microphone in there yeah. as well. If you're sitting at a table having yes, coffee, maybe. make sure the coffee is not in front of you on the table. Okay, okay. okay. Ну хорошо, я значит говорю, Мигрос, Макдональд, да? Окей. Я подъеду, тебя сразу наберу. I'm on. We're rolling on hidden cameras. Все, ты готов, дорогой. VRL takes a taxi. We follow close behind. Maria has set the meeting in a public place, a shopping mall full of tourists and affluent Turks. Catch's chance at freedom hinges on the success of this meeting. There's a metal detector at the entrance. With a camera strapped to his body, Virel can't go in without setting it off. 
Алло, Мария, а где здесь вход? Потому что я там захожу, там какие-то поли полицейские, вход... Э... В смысле, чер через эти ворота? Бюрел использует свой телефон, как декой, чтобы пройти. Ты? Ты? We follow VRL a safe distance behind. Hello? I'm in the burger, or what do you call it? Ah, McDonald's. Yes, it's written in McDonald's. Здесь рядышком вот бар есть, вот я возле него сейчас. Шакер, шакес, пэре какой-то. Быстро. А, быстро. Ты беленькая? Что, идем писать? Что ты будешь? Есть ли его? VRL's tape runs out. Our hidden camera runs long enough to catch them leaving, but we don't hear the end of their conversation. If VRL's act worked, he's one step closer to getting Katya back. He returns to the hotel on his own in case he is being watched. How did you leave it with her? No, I was going to call her. Today she will call me tomorrow morning. Tomorrow is important that there was nothing to do with her, because she can check. She says that she is on neutral territory. Hello, Mary. Hello, Mary. Hello, Mary. Hello, Mary. Hello, 
nothing left to do but wait for Maria's call. Eva came to Canada thinking that she was going to be a housekeeper, but the contract she signed was in English, a language she didn't understand at the time. Yeah, that's the motel. She was picked up at the airport by her employer and brought directly to this motel. It doesn't look exactly the same. It feels really weird. My stomach is jumping up and down. The doors used to be burgundy. Yeah, it's scary. Oh, Jesus. It's even smell the same. Wow. We're going into the room, we sit down, and that's when he informed me what is the contract is really about, which wasn't a babysitting or a housekeeping. It was an um, exotic dancer. I thought it's just a nightmare, and I was shocked. But when they actually took me into the strip joint, I realized that this is the reality. That was the very first strip joint I ever seen in my life. Unbeknownst to Eva, she was brought to Canada by her traffickers under the Exotic Dancer or Stripper Visa program. Under this program, thousands of women were brought to Canada legally, often ending up trapped by their employers. Canada is complicit in the trafficking of women by legalizing the Stripper Visa. So what have you just done to these third world women, these women from destitute countries? You've made them prisoners, but you've legalized their situation. So they're beaten up in these bars. They are forced to commit all kinds of sexual acts. And the Canadian government has sanctioned it by stamping a visa and saying, come to Canada to strip. Well, about the first week or two, I didn't do anything. I was just sitting there. So they were really mad at me. So one of the Hungarian guy came into my room and said that I'm no longer a princess and I better start to believe that this is the reality and I better start to uh, make myself worthwhile. And they said that they know that I never done anything like this before though, so they thought they might just help me by teaching me how to get comfortable with strangers. So uh, the next, thing was that someone else walked into my room and got comfortable with me in a level, if you know what I mean. When guys just came in and taught me how to be a good girl, that usually actually took a place on this bed. Yeah. They could force you to have sex, whoever they want. Over that, I had no power, and they did have power over me. I never thought that something like this could happen in Canada. These women are being trafficked to the West. Canada's probably 3,000, 5,000 a year. In the United States, they figure 20, 25,000 a year. But Europe is the major destination. Germany, upwards of 80,000, 40, 50,000. In the Netherlands, Spain and Italy and Turkey. All of these countries are getting trafficked women. Anywhere there's a horny guy, there are trafficked women.
flats. They're um, commonly referred to. Um, it's basically a brothel. And most of the girls that, that work in them flats are Eastern European. I mean, it's, it's got to be 90%, isn't yeah. it? it? It really is quite very high, especially in this area. I mean, in Soho, I mean, virtually every flat you go into, the girls will be from Eastern Europe. So the walk-in flats are generally situated between the shops. Um, and they're sort of mostly identified by a little sticker on the door, which is, say, for example, model upstairs. Um, and then once you go in, you go up the stairs, and again, there might be another little sticker on the door. A lot of them come over here on false pretenses, on the understanding that they're going to be working in a hotel um, or, or, or a shop or basically anything. But then when they get here, it's a different story. The scale of the problem is huge. There are thousands of women trafficked into the UK for prostitution, um, not just London. Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, all got quite big trafficking problems. It's like not alive. It's like you not live, like you did. And people use you only. You can't think, you can't do it, you can't. Because you're scared, because you're a machine. You're not human. Afraid for her life and the safety of her family back home, Natasha asked that her identity be concealed. Natasha's torturous journey into sexual slavery took her from Ukraine to Romania and then on to Yugoslavia, Albania, Italy, Germany, and Belgium. From there, she was brought to England. In all, she was sold six times. They smuggled me into England in the back of a lorry. I was put in the box in the back. The box was full of wheels. I could barely breathe. I can't move pain, all, all my body pain, because eight hours in one position, it's very hard. We come to England. The lorry was never checked. Nobody looked at the border. We went to London. He's put me in the sauna. I don't want to say which sauna. <laughs> In countries like England or Germany, girls are more expensive. The price of a girl depends on how good-looking she is and how obedient she is. Pimps want to know if she's going to be a problem. First week when I came to London, I was very busy. I had 50 or maybe 60 customers. Everybody want to try the new girl. They want extras. Extra, it's mean without condom. It's mean anal sex. It's mean two men and one girl. They're being raped by British men over and over again. And I think Britain has to take responsibility for the fact that it's British people who are continuing to abuse these women, no matter who put them there in the first place. That's what's happening. And we need to look far more at the demand problem in trafficking. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you want to kill this man, you know. If, if it's gentle, it's all right, but if it's tell you you're a prostitute, you're a bitch, you're a dog, you know, this is kill you. This is kill you. Hello? Hello? Marie, you can? 
Марию можно? Нет, э, через полчаса. Через, да. через полчаса? Да, да. Хорошо. Охренел вообще. Позвоним ровно в 9. Не, никто не снимает трубку. No Режим даже включен. Ну, no, блин, Думают они сейчас, обдумывают, что делать, как делать. Вот что они делают. Скотина, блин, именно, блин, я их ненавижу, я вам передать. Так они доиграются. Они в любом случае доиграются. Именно доиграются. Можно, дай мне с Катей поговорить, пару слов. А где она? Кати нет. Что значит Катя нет? Не знаю, вот, Кати нету. With no one returning his calls, Fiorel gets increasingly desperate. И запугать ее сказать, что я с полицией сейчас. Если ты встанешь, то тебе торба. Так что позвони Апо, чтобы он привез Катю. Don't do that yet. Что ж? Don't threaten with the tape yet. Then he says he brings me out of the car with a tape recorder and show her here's the evidence we're gonna get her. You know we're gonna get her. Ты скажешь, международный агент Интерпола. I'll say I'm an Interpol guy. Ты присядешь с нами, присядешь с нами, я ей открою и скажу, посмотри. У вас все записано, на вас торба. Феликс, она вчера говорила ясно, я, хотел, я хочу ее убить. Вот так она говорила в камеру, я хочу ее убить. Мы хотели помочь Фиорел, но это создало дилемму для нас. He wants to take the videos that we filmed undercover right. and use them to threaten the pimp's wife to make her, she'll see that she was being followed and use that as a threat in the hopes of getting back his wife. And on one hand, he thinks it's leverage for him. And on the other hand, I don't know if we're crossing a line. What, what do you guys think? He's, he's not a, exactly a, a rational guy at this point. He says that he's desperate. He wants to go for the bank as a shock value. He wants to threaten them, and he thinks it's going to work. Frankly, I think there's more of a danger that if they see that, what's the point of giving up his wife? They'll just hurt her, her, kill her. Kill. They're going to kill him. So it, it's, it's a big threat to him to do it that way, I would think. So and I, don't, I don't think it would accomplish anything. But I'm just worried that. Uh, that he puts himself in more danger. And that he ends up getting the crap eaten out of him, if not worse. And that we end up being responsible for that because we provided the materials for that. We told Virel we felt that using our undercover footage to threaten Maria would put him and Katya in more danger. None of this matters until Virel gets hold of Maria or Apo. Rolling record. Hello? Hello? Apu, can I call Marie? Apu, Marie, no. And when will she be? Hello? Hello? This is Serge. When will she be? Let's call me. Apu, can you call me? Yes. Что у меня все на руках. Хорошо, я опоздание. Хорошо, давай, я жду звонка. И да раз дрявый. Ты звонил Апо, говорил ему? Я скажу, Апо. 
Скажи ему обязательно, чтобы сегодня перезвонил, потому что завтра будет поздно, так ему и скажи. Чего он не, не позвонит мне? Хорошо. Спасибо. Мария, есть? Мария, нет. Ты можешь ей позвонить, сказать, чтобы она мне перезвонила? А, хорошо. Хорошо? Хорошо. Скажи ей только тут, прямо сейчас, чтобы она перезвонила. Сейчас позвоню. Опа. Окей. Да. Спасибо. Да. Разве не очень. Как эти турки меня достали. Окей, сейчас позвоню. Окей, сейчас позвоню. Окей, сейчас позвоню. Да сколько можно, ёбарсы? Increasingly desperate, Fiorel drives around the streets of Antalya in the vague hope of spotting Katya. Практически невозможно. Было. Связались. Знаю, хочу вернуть жену. Я постоянно думаю, что ее где-то встречу, по дороге, еще где-то. Конечно, волнуюсь. Обо всем волнуюсь. О ее здоровье, о беременности, чтобы ее не били, не издевались над ней. Чтобы ее кормили. Я обо всем волнуюсь. Видеть все рестораны, все бары, все отели. И не могу их всех проверить. Я отбил все пороги. Все. Maria and Apo never call back, but Viorel won't give up. Most trafficking victims have no way out. A few manage to run away, but most are discovered and arrested as prostitutes in police raids. Their brush with authority is the beginning of a new nightmare. When the cops find them, they deport them. The police just simply bring them to the immigration authorities and they are deported. They're re-victimized yet again by the system. So they have no recourse to anything because they're in the country illegally. In most countries, these women are treated as illegal immigrants with no access to the justice system. The authorities simply view them as prostitutes. I was desperately trying to think of some way to get out. I wanted to go to the authorities, but I couldn't. I called home. She was saying, Mother, I can't take it anymore. Please go to the police. Maybe they can rescue me. I went to our police, and they said, didn't she know what she was going for? Meaning, she knew what she was getting into, and we don't deal with prostitutes. These women have been trafficked into prostitution. They don't want to be there. They don't want to have sex with the men who come in. And if you don't want to have sex with someone and it happens anyway, that's rape. And I think we need to stop looking at these women as being criminals. And we need to start looking at them as victims of crime. Natasha was arrested during a police raid in the London sauna where she worked. The police came and took me to the police station. I didn't have passport, I didn't have any documents. If they don't let me stay here, I don't know what I'm going to do. If I go back, I'm scared of what would happen to me. 
if these females are deported as prostitutes sent back to their own countries, invariably they fall back into the hands of the exploiters, of the traffickers, of the pimps, who literally turn them round and send them back again into another town, into another city, via a different route. We need to break that particular loop. We need to break that particular circle. There are a lot of young women who have gotten jobs, legitimate jobs, 10%, 15%, 20%, who knows? So they're willing to roll the dice. And in rolling the dice, when they leave their country, they're saying to themselves, is there going to be a real job, or am I going to be you know, thrown into the prostitution trade? <laughs> Черная полоса той стороны. Но есть же и светлая, там же работают люди. В домах работают, зарабатывают, приезжают. Ну, почему ты думаешь, что если со мной случилось такое-то с тобой? Я же не хочу думать, что со мной тоже такое случится. Думать. Я, я когда ехала, я думала, что со мной такое случится. Что же не думала? Ну, не знаю. Думаешь, что ты хочешь ее оставить с мамой? Ты думаешь, что едешь, она плакать не будет? Я тоже думала, выехала. Какой был результат, Оля? Я восемь месяцев не могла домой вернуться. Восемь месяцев. И избивали. И что они только не делали. Это было вообще, это просто ужас какой-то был. Маша, отсюда! Это будет сложно, но я думаю, пока она маленькая. Будет трудно, да, маме? Первое время, может, даже месяц. Но она привыкнет. Мне лично не очень хочется туда поехать. Вообще не хочется. А тут уже вынуждена. Это и тут понимаю. So Сильнейшее не считай. Я просто уже не могу. Она уехала. Сами видите, она уехала. Она уехала. Она уехала. Она уехала. I'm very scared for her. Very scared. My goal is to buy a house. Any house. Then I'd never leave that house again. Virel finally gave up trying to reach Apo and Maria. After pacing the streets of Antalya for days, he had no choice but to return in despair to Tiraspol. But his phone calls did have an effect. Apo and Maria took Katya to the Antalya airport and sent her home. Расскажи мне, как все произошло? Это как-нибудь в другой раз. Не сейчас, а не сегодня. So many of these girls, when they're rescued or they're discarded on the streets because they're of no more use to the pimps and the brothel owners, go home. They come home psychologically devastated. They come home with all kinds of medical problems, sexually transmitted diseases, they're, they're HIV positive, they have AIDS. There's nothing for them. What does she go back to when she had serviced 10 men a night? He said his name was Apo. I was in hysterics. A girl came in. She was a bit taller than me. She was blonde. 
I found out later her name was Tanya. Maria's real name is Tanya. In her dealings with Fiorel, she'd been using Maria as an alias. She told me that I belonged to them and that they bought me in order to have sex with their clients. When I started to resist, she said, you're not the first. We already had girls like you. Those girls that didn't want to do it at first, work and enjoy it now. I told her, if you like to fuck Turkish men, then you fuck them. She slapped me and left. Katya didn't suspect what kind of plans I had for her in Turkey. How could she suspect? My plan was to keep her in the dark. Katya turned out to be a stubborn girl, a girl with attitude. They brought a man and told me, if I don't satisfy him, they'll kill me. But when the man entered the room, I started fighting with him. Two other men came in and pinned me down. They drugged me and beat me and raped me. I thought it was all over for me. They knew from the beginning that I was pregnant. Vlad knew that. Soon after Katya's return, the Ukrainian police arrested Vlad and charged him with trafficking for the purposes of sexual exploitation. Do you think it's important to testify? Yes. I think it's important that people like him are punished. I hope that no other girl experiences what I did. I'm always surprised when any woman agrees to testify because it's such a huge thing for them to do. I mean, one of the, the common features of trafficking is that women are, you know, beaten themselves and threatened. The traffickers threaten to kill them, kill their parents, kill their sisters, kill their children. And the women have had it beaten into them that if they do this, these threats will be carried out. Vlad has spent one month in custody awaiting his trial. 
he is facing up to 15 years in prison. Katja bravely agreed to testify against him, but in a bizarre turn of events, both Katja and Virel were not informed of the court date. No witnesses were called. When they showed up, they were told that they couldn't attend the trial. We didn't even know that today is the court. I knew that today is the court. We didn't even invite us to the court. There was a feeling that we didn't exist. Katja was not there for the court. Katja was not there. In the name of Ukraine, for the record, Mr. Vlad V is accused of criminal activity. The accused is charged with finding women in the Republic of Moldova and bringing them to the city of Istanbul, Turkey, in order to sell them for the purpose of sexual exploitation. As payment for his criminal activity, the accused received $1,000 for the sale of Katia B. According to Article 189 of the Criminal Code of Ukraine, the defendant is hereby sentenced to no less than five years imprisonment. However, according to Article 75, the accused will be released from the five-year sentence and put on five years probation. Is the sentence clear to you? The court session is adjourned. Prosecutions around the world against traffickers are a joke. We have laws in every country on the planet that say you can't abduct people, you can't kidnap, you can't uh, force them into prostitution, you can't assault them. But when you look at the situations that Ukraine and Romania find themselves in, or Moldova, which is one of the most impoverished countries on the planet, these countries just don't bother. The laws are there, but they're not being enforced. Ну что, закончился суд, ему дали пять лет, условно. Нам обещали, ему дадут 8 лет, 15 лет, но ни в коем случае не 5 лет, условно. I guess I had a good lawyer. Спасибо ему большое. I'm grateful. The judge turned out to be a good guy as well. He understood my situation. Сказали на иди занимайся. У тебя очень хорошее прибыльное дело. Продавай людей. Я просто в шоке. За продажу людей, за изнасилование, за избиение, за моральный ущерб. Вот так взять просто отпустить человека. Это уж слишком. Tanya was saved in Turkey by a sympathetic client who bought her out. She returned home penniless, only to discover that her brother's condition had worsened. Out of sheer desperation, Tanya has decided to go back to Turkey to prostitute herself. I have no other choice. We've poured a huge amount of money because we didn't want to lose him. And we've been told to pay it back. If we don't, we'll be in trouble, especially our children. Anything could happen to them when we're not around. So I have to go there to earn the money. Please understand that I just want to save my brother. Because of the abuse she suffered at the hands of her traffickers, Katya had to terminate her pregnancy. If I learned one lesson from this experience, it's not to trust anyone. I won't let Katya go anywhere alone. 
Katya and I don't know what the future holds. Right now, all I'm doing is trying to recover and put this behind me. Then maybe we can think about having another baby. Thank you.